President Donald Trump of the U.S. on Tuesday had a telephone conversation with President Muhammad Buhari and declared support for Nigeria on the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, disclosed this at a daily media briefing of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. He said the U.S. President promised to send across ventilators to Nigeria. Also, the personal assistant to the President, Bashir Ahmed, disclosed this on his Twitter handle that President Buhari used the opportunity to brief the American President on the steps that Nigeria is taking to curtail the spread of the disease. We have Dr. Chima Onoka, a medical practitioner, join us from the United States via Skype. Thank you very much for your time on the news. Thank you, Felicity. 91 new confirmed coronavirus cases a drop from a drop from Wednesday morning. What's your assessment of the new cases we have? Um, thank you. I think, um, you know, we're identifying the cases that we can, those who are infected that we can, you know, based on our testing capacity. But I think that's the thing that will grow over time. Mm. It will grow as our testing capacity expands. Um, there have also been recoveries, which begs the question, what is in use uh, to treat the recovered cases? Well, for people recovering, the bulk of what is done is really supportive treatment. It is, is really to support those who are sick. I mean, if you know, you're trying to see that um, um, if somebody needs oxygen, he gets it. If somebody needs a ventilator, that um, if there is one, you can put the person on a ventilator. And then you support the person's immune system as much as possible. Um, and then for many people, many people recover from it without even an intervention. Mm. So oh. it's a viral infection and um, treatment isn't the issue really. It's supporting the person to go through the period. All right, let's go back to the figures that we have. We know it's over 100. Um, do we expect to see a decline anytime soon? I don't think that um, what we'll have is a decline. It's increasing numbers as our testing capacity expands. A lot of people have the infection, and um, what the testing does is to detect them. So as you, if you double it, you're going to find a lot of people. Um, and that's why there's always that issue about what is the capacity and how many people we have tested. But as you know, the way the laboratories are being activated, um, that testing will expand and we'll find that there are so many more people that have it in Nigeria than um, we are capturing. Okay, a sitting governor suggested uh, that the samples of those who recovered be used to test for of a scene uh, that could be capable of curing uh, the virus. How possible is this? And are there other sites uh, that we're just not um, aware of or not foreseen? I think that's, you know, um, those are the things that, that go on already. I mean, with or without having said it, it's the, you know, the, the virus gets profiled. The National Institute of Medical Research did that. And, um, you know, using samples of um, um, people, what is, you know, what samples taken from people, there's a lot of studies going out to match the virus against and to pick out antibodies as well. So those are things that are actually going on. When you now talk about doing it to scale, that's a different discussion. I mean, um, the core thing is that these things are going on, and um, I don't think it's new. Okay, let, let's consider the um, number of testing and the promise that uh, more labs will be brought in to increase the speed of testing. Um, do you think we're maybe a little too slow, and how can they go about ensuring that we get more of these testing laboratories? Um, yes, I, I think the core 
challenge from um, my understanding has been the logistics of, of getting it. And then, you know, people also not, um, you know, feeling strongly about reporting um, that they have a problem. And so maybe because of the stigma, some, you know, people have attached quite some stigma to it. Um, but I believe that, you know, with the laboratories that are expanding, we can test more. Two, as um, the kits increase, we will have opportunity to test more people. But then a critical part, I believe strongly, is that our testing needs to go to where people need them, where we meet people. You see, the, the, the symptoms of COVID, are like they're just, you know, being, it's just revealing itself every day. Uh, like um, increasingly, even like people, the way people feel when they have malaria. So that means that every facility that we have is a place where anybody can go because of symptoms that are related to COVID-19. And so it's difficult to, to say exactly what is happening. So that is why I believe that the health system's approach to it is by having wherever where healthcare is offered. We have lists, for instance, for the government facilities. We also know where the private facilities are, especially through the Association of General and Private Medical Practitioners of Nigeria. And then even governments like Lagos State have a list of the private facilities that are there. We need to find a way to get them involved in this. Otherwise, we will keep having a spread and okay. we'll have to you know, it becomes more difficult. Uh, let's take your thoughts quickly on the um, lockdown situation. It's been, it's going to be till Monday, and then there will be a gradual relaxation um, of this lockdown. Apparently, uh, the effect on the economy is really, really high. What's your take on the decision of the Nigerian government to go ahead and gradually release, um, reduce the uh, strictness of the lockdown, especially um, with arguments that we were too quick to copy and paste approaches from other parts of the world? Well, other parts of the world are still also checking their own, um, especially those that instituted the kind of lockdown that we did. Not on, you know, not like countries like Japan that didn't start from, from that at the beginning. So the strategy was different. So the, we, we, we have the lockdown and then we have um, people need to wait based on the government's orders. Um, but we also know all of those challenges and, um, you know, especially to the economy. And it's a big issue. It's really a big issue. I think really that um, what we need to do now is to be preparing for what will happen after, for once people are being released, because even with what we have, people are mixing up, people are coming, people are moving around. Whenever you do, you start another cycle. If somebody who is infected meets somebody in the streets on that, during that time that is open, you start a cycle if there's transmission, if transmission happens. So we really need to be preparing for the post-lockdown period. Right. We need to have clear, everybody being clear about what um, we're going to do after it. Mm. But then I must mention clearly, I think it's important to mention, the issue of people having food to eat. The worst thing that can happen now is that people come at the end of the lockdown and their immune system have been compromised because of malnutrition. They will be at a worse state to deal with a flu, to deal with an infection like this. So whatever needs to be done for people not to be hungry, not to get malnourished, we all need to support ourselves and encourage the government, support the government and work with ourselves to do that. 
All right, before I let you go, let's talk about the promise of ventilators from Donald Trump uh, to Nigeria. And we also know that um, the EU and uh, the WHO, IMF, everybody's speaking in to help, but particularly the case of the U.S. Um, some persons are saying there are more cases in the U.S. than in Nigeria. Um, do you share the view that there is anything suspicious and the concern being expressed by uh, the U.S. president to the Nigerian government um, on the... I mean, the COVID-19 situation. You see, my take is this. When these are times where it's not only health that is the issue, it's good that there are offers. A lot of the offers are also that you're paying with the resources you have. Resources are limited, and so you prioritize resources. What will be priority? It is based on what we also find with the illness. What proportion of people will need a ventilator? The truth is that it's a small number. And there are studies that have shown that even those who really will need ventilators, um, it's like um, there's already, there's, um, there's just little that you can do. So in a situation where we are, I will, you know, think about our investments with whatever money we are getting, whether what we have or loans that we're getting, you start from investments in prevention, for, for prevention. Then you go straight to those ones of testing, then the ones of providing oxygen. These go a lot, you know, will go a lot further than a focus on ventilators. We need to be careful with whatever is offered. And um, it's not just ventilators will be because you have people are infected, from infection, it's not, you know, you have a few people who get very sick. Those who get very sick, you have a further few who will need a dependence on oxygen. And then you now have to go further to talk about those who will need their respiration to get assisted with a ventilator. Those are the things that will determine where we make our investments. And then, so it should tell us clearly what we should do as a country in response to this. All right, Dr. Chima, thank you very much for your thoughts and the news. Thank you very much, Felicity.